And so we're continuing our, our Easter Tide series, and uh, it's entitled The Stories of the Kingdom. And we're trying to get a, a feel for this mysterious kingdom that Jesus spoke about in, in his parables, how it plays out or how it takes shape in the book of Acts. And so today we're looking at Acts 16, and we're going to see how the gospel triumphs in the lives of, of three very differing people through the faithful witness of Paul and his companions by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the takeaway is real simple for us, and it's straightforward. You see, because if we desire to be faithful witnesses of this gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to know that it is God who exercises sovereign control over all things. And the call for us then is to follow his leading. And we trust in him, not ourselves, for the outcome. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then let's look to his word. Father, we ask that you would make your word this morning a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart and from the heart to the lip in conversation. And Lord, as the rains return not empty, so me, neither may your word, but let it accomplish that for which it is given, Lord, the strengthening of our faith, the assurance of our salvation, and the obedience of our hearts. And Lord, may the words of my mouth now and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Can I get some water, please? <laughs> so we open up to chapter 16 in the book of Acts, and we see that Paul and Silas, they come to the region of Derbe and, and Lystra, and they run into, as Angela read for us, a, this young disciple by the name of, of Timothy. Timothy is well spoken of in that region, and Timothy's father is Greek, and his mother was a Jewish believer. Paul wanted to take him on that second missionary journey with he and Silas, so we're told that Paul had him circumcised to thwart off any drama that they would encounter along the way. Now, this is, this is pretty significant because we know at the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas had to separate company because of a disagreement concerning John Mark. So right away, there's no coincidence that we find Timothy there at Derby and Lystra. And so here's Paul and his new companions now, Paul and Silas and now Timothy. And they're going through these regions in Derby and Lystra, and they are strengthening the churches. And there at the end of verse 5, as Angela read, we see that the churches are increasing in number. We get to verse 6, and we see that all is going along very well in the region of Asia Minor. But now Paul and his companions, they're traveling through this region of Phrygia and Galatia, and they want to go south down into Asia and preach the gospel there. But Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit forbid them from doing that. Okay, well, they tried to go north into the region of Bithynia, and then we read again, the spirit of Jesus forbade them from, from doing that. And so then they kind of touched below to this place called Mycenae, and they made their way to Troas. And so now they're at the northwestern port, part of Asia Minor, and it's right there that Paul receives a vision. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And then Luke says that after Paul receives this vision, he does something in verse 10. Paul inserts himself, I'm sorry, Luke inserts himself into the narrative. He said, immediately, we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so we take time just to read those couple verses, verses 6 through, through 10. Reread them in, in meditation or even discuss them in your small groups this week. And we all have to conclude that like, there is no coincidence as to what is taking place. The Lord is in control. 
The Lord is the one who provided the people for Paul. No Barnabas, I'll just give you Silas. No John Mark, I'll just give you Timothy. Matter of fact, I'll give you Luke, who's also a a physician. The Lord provided the people. The Lord is the one who gave the vision to Paul. And it's the Lord who made the decision for them to go to Macedonia. And so after these missionaries come to this conclusion... Luke tells us that they sailed from Troas all the way to Samothrace, Neapolis, and then to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia. Why are they going there? For the sole reason to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. So back in March, I was preaching at one of our sister churches in in Fort Myers. And so I arrived, and I met the tech team, and they gave me a clicker. They said, feel free to click your slides as you are going through your sermon. Never done that before. They, they clicked from the booth. I said, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I stood up, introduced myself, gave the introduction to the sermon, and then what do you know? I went to click, nothing. And everybody's looking at me like he's going to have to say something else. And I'm sitting there fumbling with that clicker. And then finally, after a few rounds, I got that clicker going. And I continued to move through the sermon, clicking away. Mission accomplished. Sermon was finished. After the service was over, the tech team comes running up to me, just a bunch of young people, solid and dedicated. They came up to me, and they're apologizing profusely. They're like, We are so sorry for that mishap. I said, not a problem, guys. I did have a false start, but after a while, I I got going. And then the young lady on the tech team, she looked at me and she says, we forgot the batteries. (laughs) And so I said, "Uh uh-oh. She says, every time I saw your hand go up to click that slide, I just clicked it from the back. Like... I thought that I was in control, but in reality, she was the one that is that was in control. And the same thing, like the same thing is true of us. Like if we think that we are in control of our lives, and if we think that we are in control of the things that we do in this world, we are setting ourselves up for a huge surprise in our relationship with the Lord. Because the Lord is the supreme creator and sustainer of the universe. And he is sovereign over all of his creation. And that certainly includes you. And that certainly includes me. We said together earlier in the service that the Lord is our shepherd. Therefore, we don't need another shepherd. We don't want another one because we have every single thing that we want and need in this shepherd, one who cares for us, provides for us. He protects us and he comforts us. And how comforting is it to know that when we turn to John 10, Jesus Christ says, I am the good shepherd. And he is not to be confused with the hired hand because a hired hand has absolutely no skin in the game. The hired hand does not care about the sheep. But that is not the case with our good shepherd because our good shepherd demonstrates his loving care for every single one of us by laying down his life for ours. And because of the good news of his resurrection, We can live with confidence that come what may, goodness and mercy will follow us, church, all the days of our lives. And we can live with the eternal hope that one day we truly will dwell in the presence of our Lord and Savior forever and ever. And so we are called to to follow our good shepherd No matter where he leads us, this was Paul's call. This was the companions of Paul, their call as well. Because the Lord is is, is working his good and his perfect will in our lives and also in the lives of others. So we look what happens next in the text. It's now the Sabbath day. Remember, Paul usually made a habit to go to the synagogues first to preach the gospel to the the men who were gathered there for for prayers and also for fellowship. 
So by inference, we recognize that they may not have been a synagogue in Philippi, but they find out that there is a place of prayer outside of the city gates. So Paul and his companions, they go outside of the city gates and they go down by the riverside. And there they are met by a lot of women, women only. And so they don't quibble about that. Rather, Luke tells us that they sat down and they spoke to these women. And then Luke singles out a woman by the name of of Lydia. Lydia was from Thyatira. It was the center of the purple dye trade. And she was doing good, profitable business right there in Philippi. We also find out that Lydia was a worshiper of God. And so here is this successful woman, head and shoulders above the majority of women in the ancient world, successful, doing business in Philippi, practicing piety in Philippi. But there was something that was missing from Lydia's life. You see, Lydia had not come to a saving knowledge of God's love for her in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But all of that changed. We're told that when Paul opened up his mouth, the Lord opened up Lydia's heart to pay attention to what Paul was saying. And through this good news of the gospel that was being preached, we see that Lydia clearly saw her need for a savior. I have the absolute utmost pleasure to to teach catechism classes on a Wednesday night to our fifth graders. And for the last few weeks, we, we have been working on what the condition or the estate of man is after the fall. And what we've been learning in these last few weeks is that because of Adam's sin, we who are descendants of Adam by ordinary generation, we sinned in him and we fell with him in his first transgression. It simply means that we are unable to do any good in this world that leads to salvation because of the corruption of our hearts. Man is said to be totally depraved. That means sin, it affects every fiber of our being. And these actual sins that that we commit, it's not because of the environment. It's because it proceeds out of the corruption of our hearts. And so fallen man will never respond to the good news of the gospel unless God regenerates his heart. And so we see that Lydia's response to this good news of the gospel wasn't because of her smart business mind. It wasn't because that Lydia was was practicing piety. It was because the Holy Spirit opened up her heart to pay attention and he drew her to the saving love of God that's only found in Jesus Christ. And we see the proof of Lydia's conversion was that she was baptized and also her household. And then she extended a measure of hospitality to Paul and his companions. She says, if you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Luke says that she prevailed upon them, like she strongly urged them. Like, what were they going to say? No. Like, the Lord didn't take away her savvy business mind. She put them in a rock in a hard place. And she, they didn't say no. Why? It was because her conversion was sincere. And so was her offer of hospitality. Come to verse 16, and we see that the Holy Spirit is he's still leading these men and spreading the fragrance of the gospel there in Philippi. Luke tells us there's another occasion in They're going back to this place of prayer. And this time, they don't run across another Lydia. Rather, they come across a a slave girl who is said to be influenced by a spirit of divination, whereby she can predict the future. In Greek mythology, she has what is known as a python spirit. She's possessed by the spirit of of a serpent. Pastor and theologian Sinclair Ferguson, uh, he says in his sermon on this that she was suffering from a double bondage. 
She was enslaved by these greedy taskmasters that were using her as a commodity, but she was also enslaved by this serpent spirit that was enabling her to predict the future. Ferguson goes on and he says that what Luke is doing here in this portion of Scripture, he's trying to help us and teach us to distinguish from that which is supernatural and that which is divine. Because, you see, everything that this young lady was saying was supernatural. She was speaking the truth. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. But every single word that was coming out of her mouth originated from the pit of hell for the purposes of souring the fragrance of the gospel that was being spread in Philippi that very moment. We know how it goes. The gospel goes forth and, and so does the enemy, seeking to destroy the good work of God. And the apostle Paul knew this as well. And this nonsense went on for many, many days, Luke tells us. And then Paul just looks at that young lady and he commands that spirit to leave, to depart. And Luke tells us in that very hour, immediately, the spirit left this girl. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. She's free. And then when these greedy slave owners recognize that they now are officially out of business. But what follows are not acts of hospitality, but acts of horrific persecution. They're told that they grab Paul and they grab Silas and they drag them into the marketplace right before the city officials on some bogus charges. They speak pejoratively of Paul and Cyrus. These men are Jews. They blamed them for throwing the city up into an uproar, accused them of breaking the law. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And then a mob forms against Paul and Silas. We're told that they're stripped of their clothes and they're beaten repeatedly with wooden rods. They beat some more. And then they're thrown into the dungeon of the prison. And if that's not enough for good measure, they place their feet in stocks. They put them under the custody of the jailer. Lydia's story is, is so easy for us to identify with, isn't it? Like we go out wherever we go. We strike up a conversation with someone. It leads to a gospel conversation. We share the good news. The Lord opens up their heart. They believe, they repent from sin, and we come back. I shared the gospel, and someone got saved. Yes. Amen. But this one here is a toughie. Like we stand up to evil in the name of Jesus Christ, and, it res and, and the response is persecution and injustice of the highest order. If we did a secret ballot poll here this morning, and I said, which one would you all prefer, Lydia or the slave girl demonic stuff? How would, we, how would we answer that question? You see, the truth is, in, in Paul's case, this sharing the gospel leading to great hospitality and taking a, a stand in the name of Jesus Christ over evil leading to prison was all a part of God's will for Paul's life. And the same has got to be said of Silas as well. Biographer Ruth Tucker, she, she writes this about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, who was arguably the greatest missionary of his era, proved faithful in suffering and emotional disappointments throughout his missionary endeavors. Ultimately, Paul cast the die for all who would follow after him in preaching the gospel, faithfulness to the call till death. And so we even look at this text and we see that Paul was faithful in sharing the good news in that women's Bible study. And Paul was faithful in evoking the name of Jesus in the face of evil. 
in both of those cases, what we see is the fragrance of the gospel going forward and Paul trusting in the Lord for the outcome, even if that meant suffering. And we know that Paul remained faithful till, till death. But we don't stop at Paul. Rather, we recall the greater faithfulness of our Savior, who was perfectly obedient all the way to the cross, where he suffered a gruesome death on your behalf and on mine in bringing us into fellowship with God. Like he's the one who set the die for Paul to follow. And we cannot exclude ourselves from that mix as well. Our individual mission fields will vary, church, according to the will of God. But faithfulness to the call in each individual context is always the standard. And for some of us, it may be and it may entail suffering. You see, because it just may be that the Lord has us endure suffering in order for his redemptive purposes to be realized in someone's life. This is what we see taking place in the text. The suffering that Paul and Silas endured was part of God's plan for bringing redemption to this lost jailer and also his household. There was a purpose in their suffering. And that means that there is a purpose in ours if that is what God calls us to do. It's now midnight. These men are now locked away in this prison cell. And what are they doing? They're singing praise to God. And they're offering up prayers to God. And people are hearing them as they're locked away in that dungeon. And what happens next is absolutely no coincidence because we're told that a, a great earthquake, it shook the foundations of the prison and the prison bars flew open and the stocks that were fastened on people's feet, they were, they were loosened. What we see is the sovereign hand of, of God at work in, in delivering his people according to his plan and also his purpose. The Philippian jailer now wakes up, and what does he see? He sees that the prison bars are flung open. The prisoners are no longer in their stalls. And he knows what this means for himself. This means death because he's not able to, to carry out his duties. And so he seeks to commit suicide. But the apostle Paul, although he had every opportunity to escape, Paul stays put. And Paul calls out to this guy, do not harm yourselves, for we are all here. And we see that the jailer now calls for the torches. And he comes and he's afraid, falls before Paul and, and Silas. And as he's bringing them out, he asks the most important question in all of life. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, perhaps the jailer had salvation from his natural calamity in mind. But Paul and Silas knew that he needed to be saved from a greater calamity. He needed to be saved from the wrath of God, from sin and eternal separation from God. And they pointed him to the only one who could heal his sin-sick soul. They didn't ask for clarification they didn't help him hatch a plan in order to save his neck from the magistrates. They declared to this jailer the gospel truth. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Luke tells us that that's not all as well. Is that they shared the word with the jailer and all who were in his household that like they took time to unpack the gospel story, and it resulted in salvation. And we see that on this glorious night, this once lost jailer, he washed the wounds of these missionaries, and he and his family received a washing of another sort, one that symbolized the removal of guilt and sin 
from their lives through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And what followed was just a joyous celebration. The jailer and his family and these missionaries, they celebrated that salvation that came to their house based on the jailer's belief in the one true God. You see, because believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is synonymous with believing in the one true God. Remember how Lou ended his sermon to us last week. He said that Jesus is, is not a genie. He's not a genie who is supposed to help us get through tough times. Jesus is not that phantom friend that we, we can expect to, to take us to heaven when we die. Jesus is none of those things. Jesus is Lord. I remember singing that song when I was a boy. You guys, you remember how it goes. He is Lord. He is Lord. Help me out. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. I didn't fully understand what I was saying when I was, when I was singing that at the age of nine and ten. I just loved the melody because it was so sweet. But now I realize as I look back, I was, I was singing the gospel truth that Jesus Christ truly is Lord. You know, years later, Paul would, would pen a letter to this church, and he would exhort them to a kind of humility that was already theirs in Jesus Christ. And Paul would say that although Jesus existed in the form of God, Although he enjoyed equality with God, it's not something that he grabbed a hold on to and he grasped onto. Rather, Jesus, he made himself nothing by being made in human likeness. He was born as a human being, and he humbled himself by becoming obedient, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Paul and Silas, they did not tell this man this jailer, why don't you go ahead and make Jesus Lord of your life? No, he is Lord then. He is Lord now. And he is Lord forevermore. And this is the call to believe in the sovereign Lord of all creation. You see, when the Spirit opens up our hearts to this gospel truth, we will turn from this sin of self-sufficiency, and we will acknowledge that the Lord does indeed own us, and everything that we have is his, and therefore he has the sovereign right to tell us what to do. And we recognize as we look out into the world, there are many that are still hostile to his reign and refuse to acknowledge his lordship. But the truth of his lordship remains steadfast. He is not just savior. He is not just Messiah. He is Lord of all, and he is Lord over all. And there is coming a day when every knee will bow in submission to this reality. So at the end of the narrative, 
we see that the city officials, they find out through Paul's protest that he and Silas were indeed Roman officials. And so what that means is that these city officials, they were the ones who were the true lawbreakers in not giving the apostle Paul and Silas a fair trial. And we find out that when they came to this discovery, they were afraid of the consequences. And so they apologized to Paul and Silas, and then they made a request. Why don't you guys please leave this city? And so we're told that Paul and Silas, they acquiesced to that request. But before they left, they went back to Lydia's house. And Luke tells us that they greeted the brothers and the sisters there. And they probably saw the, maybe the Philippian jailer was there. Maybe the slave girl who was freed from all of those demons was there. Maybe whoever else the fragrance of the gospel spread to was there. And Luke said that they, they encouraged the church. Because we see that the gospel triumphed in forming a covenant community through the faithful witness of these missionaries by the power of the Holy Spirit. A covenant community was formed. That's the only way it could have been formed. I mean, think about Lydia. Like Lydia thought she had it all together, but the gospel exposed her need for a savior. The, save, the, the slave girl was in double bondage, but the gospel freed her from her enslavement. And it's through the gospel that the Philippian jailer recognized that his ultimate allegiance was not to these crooked city officials in Philippi, but to the Lord Jesus Christ, who fully paid for all of his sins with his precious blood. In this same letter, in Paul's letter to the Philippian church there in, in chapter 1, Paul is now in prison again. And he's writing to encourage this church. And he says, I'm confident and I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will, will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. And so we now, we reflect on this, this good work of salvation that has been wrought in us by Jesus Christ, by the power of, of the Holy Spirit. And we thank God for that. And we reflect on this good work of salvation that has brought us and formed us into a covenant community. And we reflect on this good work of salvation that right now is conforming us into the image of our, our Savior. And we ask our Lord to help us faithfully spread the fragrance of this gospel in Tampa and, and beyond. And we, we will follow him where he leads us. And as we follow him, we will trust in him for the outcome because it is according to, to his plan and his purpose for our lives as his people and also in the lives of others. May the Lord find us faithful to that end and may we continue to depend upon him to that end. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your, your gospel that you have entrusted to us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to faithfully witness that. This good news, wherever you may send us, and may we follow you and trust in you and your sovereignty for the outcome. In Jesus' name, amen.